So if you are with us for the first time today, you came in right in the middle of a marriage series, and it's been amazing. If you weren't here, I want to encourage you to go back and, and listen to those messages. I really believe they will help you if you are married or if you're working on your marriage or if you're hoping to get married and you're just dating. I always say that, but week one, we talked about three vows that if we make could change everything. When we stand at an altar and we make vows to, to God and to one another, um, sometimes they go awry. And there are three other vows that we talked about in that week that I think could change the game and keep us in the game for a lifetime and for God to be able to do a work in the context of those new vows. Last week, we talked about conflict. It's not a matter of if, it is when you get into conflict and fights in marriage. And it's not about not having fights. It's about learning how to fight the right way and how to do it biblically where it is progressive. It actually serves a purpose to help us grow closer with one another. And these next two, these last two are going to be super interesting. And I'll, I'll tell, tell you why in just a moment. But today, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about what every man wishes his lady knew or understood about him. Um, I know that's a, big, that's a big subject, and I know it's too much to cover in one sermon. But you know, I got to thinking about, you know, a woman understanding a man, and so I thought I would start today by giving every lady in here a little look inside a man's vocabulary at some of the common phrases that we use and what they actually mean so that you can better translate or understand us a little bit better. When a man looks at you, lady, and says, it would take too long to explain, what he actually means is, I actually have no idea how it works either, but I don't want you to know that I don't know how it works, okay? When a man says to you, I cannot find it, what he actually means is, it did not fall into my outstretched arm, therefore I have no idea where it could possibly be. When a man looks at you while you are cleaning the house and says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard. <laughs> What he actually means is, I cannot hear the TV over the vacuum, and I really wish you would do something else for a while until this game or movie is over. I'm letting the cat out of the bag, boys. When a man says, of course I know where we are, what he actually means is, there is an excellent chance no one will ever see us alive again on this planet. I got 10 more, but I ain't going to do them. For the next two weeks, let me tell you where we're going to go. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. So much in the Bible about marriage. So much in the scripture, Old and New Testament. <clears throat> because it's bigger than what we really understand. It's bigger than what we really know. We, 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 we think only in the context of what the world has described marriage to be. And listen, that is so shallow. It is so frivolous compared to the depth of what marriage is compared to the Lord. And what God's instruction is for it. It's, it's so much more symbolic and bigger than we really know. But I think one of the quintessential verses that really deal specifically with marriage, and again, we're going to camp out here for two weeks, is in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look at what God says about the relationship between husbands and wives and how God gives us insight into instruction about serving each other well. And today, again, we're going to talk about what every man wishes his lady knew about him and why it matters. And that's why we're going to camp out at verse 21 and verse 22 in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to break these down for you and we'll just exegete the verses together. Ephesians 5, 21, 22. I'm going to read it out of the message translation. I really love the way that it says this. Watch what it says. Out of respect for Christ. Please don't miss that. Out of respect for Christ. Be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Jesus Christ himself. For the husband provides leadership to his wife the way that Christ does to his church. That's the metaphor, that's the symbol, that's the analogy of marriage. Not by domineering his wife, but by cherishing his wife. So just as the church follows Christ and his leadership, wives should also respond to the leadership of their husbands. After all of these years of pastoring, almost 30 years of pastoring, almost 32 years of marriage, I am convinced that every human really has five basic needs in their life. And today I want to talk about these needs and how they're filtered through a man's heart. Next week, we're going to flip the script 
and I'm going to share with you what every woman wishes her man understood about her, and I'm going to show you these five things and how they are filtered uniquely through the lenses and the heart of a woman, but for today, we're going to talk about how they're filtered through a man, so let's go through them. I want to just set the stage and tell you that wives or ladies, there are basically five secrets to your man's heart, and I want to just share them with you and walk through them as clearly and as simply as I know how. Number one, every man in this world longs for, needs, and desires unconditional love. Unconditional love. Verse 21, let's go back to the text. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Jesus Christ. It is so important, ladies, to understand that men are performance-driven. We are performance-driven. Men generally feel only as valuable as their last accomplishment or their last conquest or their last accolade. When things are going well and a man is considered a top performer, he finds great confidence and self-esteem. But you need to know that when things go wrong and his best efforts have come up short or failed, oftentimes a man will see himself as a failure. A lost job, a failed business venture, a bad decision, a financial crisis, a struggling family. These things affect a man's heart and mind in profound, profound ways because I am telling you as one, no man can be harder on himself than himself. No one can be harder on me than myself. And no man in this room, nobody can be harder on them than themselves. The truth is, we talk a lot in this world about insecurity of women and about what social media has done and about what magazines have done and about what Photoshop has done to the security of a woman. But I promise you that every man in this room struggles with insecurity as well, lady. We do. We do because we are performance driven. And sometimes our insecurity is rooted in how we measure up to other great producers. And here's what I'm trying to say. When a man knows beyond the shadow of a doubt, when a man knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that his woman's love is not rooted in just what he does or how he performs or what he produces, it frees him from the burden of feeling as though he has to earn your affection, earn your respect, and earn your love. When a man knows that he is loved because of who he is to his lady, it is all that he really needs to keep going and to keep growing. Now, we know this with our children. We, we do this, I think, pretty well with our kids because we kind of intuitively know that we should not make a child or we should not make our children earn our love and earn our respect. We need to tell our children from the time they are old enough to understand, we love you, we are proud of you, not because of just what you do, not just because of the way that you act, but because you are, my, you are my child and God gave you to me and I love you how you are. And when you love them that way, it brings a security to a child that they will not search the world for affirmation from other people in an unhealthy way. But I think we forget it when it comes to adults. I think sometimes we just think, well, we've grown out of that. No, we haven't. I think sometimes we think, well, we're mature now and we get it, we understand and we're not that insecure anymore. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Husbands and wives are. And it's important to know that we must communicate clearly to one another that we love each other unconditionally, that affirmation needs to be said often, and a man finds great stability in knowing that he is fully known by his wife, fully loved by his wife, and that we are the most important thing in their life. It is incredibly liberating to a man who is constantly comparing himself to others in life to know that he is safe in his woman's soul. That he is safe in his woman's soul. What it does is it actually allows him, watch this, to overcome his fear of failure. It actually allows him to overcome his fear of not being a top performer, and it allows him to dream bigger, go higher, because he isn't as afraid as he normally might be, knowing that no matter what, he will be loved and accepted regardless of his performance. A man craves his wife's unconditional love, and when he knows that he has it, it frees him to be all that God has called him to be. So the number one, unconditional love. Love. So I want you to ask yourself, ladies, do, <clears throat> do you encourage him because of who he is? Or do you wait until he does something that you think is worthy of praise and then giving the praise? Start with unconditional love. You will unlock a beast inside him 
that will blow your mind at what God will do in and through his life. Number two, every man in this room desires intimacy. Now, every human longs for intimacy. We were wired by God that way, but as you might imagine, there is no doubt that the difference between how men and women identify and relate to intimacy in this arena is vastly, vastly different. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about the way a woman spells intimacy, but I am going to give you no surprise when you know that a man spells intimacy S-E-X. Now, here's the problem. The world has hijacked everything good that God ever created. And because the church will not talk about it, if you've attended this church any length of time, you know that it's a problem for me and that I have a problem with it. Money, sex, all of these things that the world has hijacked, perverted, twisted, contorted, they were given by God, but because the church is afraid to talk about it, there's only one voice that's being heard, and we now have a generation being raised up to have their entire understanding of this beautiful, sacred, holy thing driven by a perverted world because preachers won't talk about it. Amen. Not in this church. Not in this church. <clears throat> I want you to know what God thinks about it. I want your children to know what God thinks about it. It's our time to, to recapture and redeem what the world has stolen. I started this series by telling you that anything God-given works best when it is God-governed. And while the world says it's casual, it's cheap, it means nothing, you can have it with as many people as you want, and it ain't going to hurt or affect anybody, God says it's a lie, and he exclusively intended for it to be between a husband and a wife in the context of marriage exclusively. And that exclusivity is what makes it sacred and holy and special and wonderful. It is a gift from God. But the world has perverted it. But listen, if you want to hear more a deep dive into that, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to a message because I'm not going to go this route today. But uh, uh, two years ago, we, we, we did a series through Song of Solomon, and I went verse by verse through the Song of Solomon, and one entire message is called Spiritual Sexuality. If you want to hear a deep dive into God's intention, then go back and listen to that message because I really believe it will bless you, help you, and that you'll understand biblically why God did the way he did in this thing. But today, what I'm talking about is basically how a man sees the world and how a man views his heart and one of the needs that men have, all right? And so while women need to emotionally connect before physical intimacy, a man needs no such time. We don't have to feel giddy. We don't have to feel close. We don't need to have long, deep conversation. I told you, you know this, men are microwaves, women are crockpots, just the way it goes, bro. <laughs> men are ready to serve dinner like, now, boy, now. I don't care what day you've had, but women like low and slow. They like barbecue, right? <laughs> Long term. <clears throat> men are McDonald's, women are Ruth's Chris. I mean, I, I could keep doing this all day. The analogies. Men are all about the destination. Women are all about the journey. Men are visual. Women are emotional. Men are totally ignited by what they see. They're visual. Women are ignited by what they feel. And you know what's amazing is that this was not a mistake, even though earlier in my life I believed it was God's cruel joke. God did it on purpose. God wired my wife the way that she wired her, and he wired me the way that he wired me, and it is not wrong. You know why? Because God intended marriage to be a lesson in selflessness. God intended marriage to be a level of maturation, whereby we begin to think about the other person's need above our own. <coughs> Marriage is one of the greatest examples of God using something to mature us and to grow us, to get out of our own way and out of our own self so that we can serve one another. But God wired a man, God wired a man in a specific way that he lives his life on constant standby at nearly all times of his life. It don't matter how good his day was, how bad his day was, it don't matter what conversations he had or didn't have, his ability to shift gears at a moment's notice is staggering. And every woman in this room knows it. Generally speaking, for a man, all it takes is one word, one look, one touch, high gear. That's it. Zero to 120. And the sexual drive God gave a man is astounding. In fact, 
It has the ability to drive him to do things that he would normally never do under rational circumstances. I did a lot of reading um, as I was preparing for this message, and uh, I read behind a couple of clinical psychologists, Christian clinical psychologists, that have really dove deep into this, this issue of marriage and, and, and how a healthy marriage works. And I want to read, read you something from a guy named Dr. Leslie Parrott that I think really encapsulates uh, really what I'm talking about. Here's what he says. I'll put it on the screen for you. Dr. Parrott said, perhaps one of the most interesting discoveries that we've learned in our research is just how much, now listen, a man defines his masculinity by his sexuality. It is simply a created part of his maleness, and we cannot erase it. It appears that sex affects a man's confidence and emotional stability as much or more than anything else. Dr. Parrott goes on to say that men have a tendency to break down or malfunction without intimacy over time in several ways. I'm not going to put it on the screen, but let me share with you three ways. He said men will begin to break down. Number one, you might experience isolation from your man. Often, if a man feels rejected, he will isolate himself, withdraw physically, and not want to open himself up for further rejection. Number two, insulation. What he says is men will often shut down emotionally. For a man, it is physical intimacy that opens the door to emotional intimacy, and without it, he may seem cold or aloof or distant from you. Dangerous distraction. This is the most dangerous one. Some men turn to other women or pornography or some other fantasy, whatever it may be, when a man doesn't experience fulfillment in this area, he will eventually begin to malfunction. But there was another psychologist that I read behind uh, who was brilliant, and her name is Dr. Barbara Rosenberg, and I really think she offers a biblical balanced view to what I'm talking about right here in terms of a husband and a wife and this level of intimacy. Let me show it to you. I put it on the screen. <clears throat> Dr. Rosenberg said, a wife, I, this is so important, a wife plays a key role in keeping her husband from desiring to fulfill his God-given needs in an unhealthy place or in something other than marriage. She is the person chosen by God. She is the person chosen by God to fill those needs. This was never designed by God as a source of manipulation of her husband, but rather to understand that she alone, she alone, she alone has the privilege of being the sole person to meet her husband's needs and that he has been given the sole responsibility of meeting hers as well. A wife has the ability to affirm her husband in a way that is beyond anything that she could possibly imagine. The reason I, I love that quote from Dr. Rosenberg is because here's what she is saying. She is saying that when we see marriage and, and intimacy physically through the lenses of the Bible, we realize what it actually really is, not what the world has made it, but it is ministry to each other, and we love one another and realize that God has selected us for all of our lives to be the one to minister to each other in this very unique and special way. And as a pastor, here's what I'll tell you. After 30 years of pastoring, healthy physical intimacy in a marriage is more important than we could possibly fathom. It is God's way of keeping us emotionally and spiritually connected. I have never counseled a couple on the verge of divorce when I said, when was the last time you had physical intimacy? said, oh, a couple hours ago. Never. Not even a couple of days ago. 99% of the time, by the time they get to a pastor's office or a counselor's office, it's been six months or a year. It's one of the first things the enemy steals let me tell you why. Just hang on. Because it is impossible to stay mad at somebody you are constantly being physically intimate with. You can't do it. You have to forgive one another. You have to say, I'm sorry. You have to say, I love you. Please help me do better. You have to find a way to bridge the gap emotionally to one another before physical intimacy to happen. And God does that on purpose. But it's one of the first things to go. But it's the way a man is wired. Next week, I'm going to tell you again how a woman spells intimacy. And you know this. It's vastly, vastly different. But every man needs unconditional love. Every man is wired to desire intimacy. Number three, every man, ladies, desires deep, meaningful friendship. Now, I want you to hear this. Deep, meaningful friendship. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 9 says it this way. Just as lotions and fragrance give sensual delight, a sweet friendship refreshes the soul. A sweet friendship refreshes the soul. Contrary to popular belief by some people, men desire deep connection. They really do. Maybe they're introverted, maybe they're a little awkward, but friendship and camaraderie is something that every man desires 
every bit as much as a woman. And while it's true that we need and long to connect with other men through recreation and friendship, I am telling you that husbands really do want to connect with their wives and, and share life together. And I want you to hear this. Friendship will not just happen naturally. Friendship has to happen intentionally. People that have been married a long time learn to do intentionally what used to come naturally, but it must be cultivated. Great marriages, I want you to hear this, great marriages are comprised of people who don't just love each other, they actually like each other. They actually like each other. They actually want to be with each other. Nothing, and I may say this again next week, so if you hear whatever, I'm just telling you right now, nothing very, I get offended and it vexes my soul when I hear a man refer to his wife as his old lady. Don't do it in my presence. Don't do it in my presence. It's disrespectful. It's not the way God wired it to be. She ain't your old lady and he ain't your old man. We are friends. We are, it is supposed to be mutual respect. We are to cherish one another, love one another, outgive one another, outserve one another, and show respect to one another. And when that happens, that friendship grows. One of the great gaps between husbands and wives is their notion and ideas about emotional intimacy and what it means to really connect on a heart level. For most women, emotional intimacy means sharing secrets or talking little things over and non-sexual affection. But one of the ways that men connect emotionally is by activities. It's by doing stuff together. A man senses emotional connection when you do things together like working in the yard, working on a home project, golfing, hunting, whatever it may be. And when you share some of your man's interests, he relates that to friendship, to true connection. So I'm just encouraging you right here, open up some discussion and find some activities you both can enjoy. Now look, look, look. I'm not saying, okay, we're empty nesters, right? Our kids have been gone for over 10 years in our house. And I have been a lifelong hardcore bow hunter. Y'all all know that for the last 35, 38 years of my entire life. My wife, finally, after she celebrated and let me hunt and not, you know, love that I love it, about, I don't know, 18 years ago, she said, what if I went with you? I said, well, load on up, son. And then she got out there, and it was too cold. And then we went, and it was too hot. And then we went, and she said, there's too many mosquitoes out here. And then we went, and she said, how long you got to sit here anyway? And then after a while, she said, where are the deer? I, you told me deer were coming. I didn't see no deer. And I said under my breath, dear God, we've made a terrible, terrible mistake. I put it on a deer. She killed the first deer. I put it on TV. It was awesome. But she wouldn't even touch the deer after we killed it. I said, baby, you're going to have to pick his head up. I mean, if you kill it, I, I mean, it's going to have to happen. So here's my point, okay? She ain't going much, all right? She tried. It ain't her thing. And guess what she loves to do? She loves to go to the beach, and we'll take $25, and we'll get the two chairs and the umbrella, and she'll be there at daylight. And she'll sit and look at nothing until dark. And I'm wanting to cut my own throat <laughs> by about 11. It's not going to happen. Okay, okay, but I'm going somewhere. Sit with me. We realized that as empty nesters, we always loved each other. We always liked it. But we had, listen, this is a big lesson for y'all. Listen carefully now. If you only build your marriage on with the well-being of your children, you are in trouble. Because one day they're going to move out. And if that is the sole source of your vision and relationship together, it ain't enough. You have to realize that the supreme of all earthly relationships, some of you are going to push back on this, but I can show it to you biblically, the, the supreme of all earthly relationships was not you and your son or you and your daughter. It was you and your wife and you and your husband. That is the way God designed it and wired it to be. And because you did not look at your children as much as you love them, you know this, they're going to go out, get married, and have families of their own. You only said, till death do us part to one person. And generally, that's the way it's going to work out. And so God wants us to put our marriage above and beyond everything else. And so 
Tina and I had to find something that we love to do together. And for us, for us, we found this amazing joy and enthusiasm in traveling the world and seeing things and experiencing things, wonderful things. And we have been all over the world. God has been good to us. We've been to Israel, Prague, Peru, Jordan, the Yucatan Peninsula, more than I could count here. We've been to Petra in Jordan, one of the eight wonders of the world. We stood at Machu Picchu together and <laughs> and thank God for the opportunity to be at one of these amazing things up in the Andes Mount. Listen, we have seen the world together, and, and I can't wait to take more adventures with my wife. So we don't save our money for stuff anymore. We save our money for experiences together, and it's bonded us in ways. We love it. There's nobody in the world I would rather spend more time with than my wife because of her love for the same thing that I love. We have found our thing. So all I'm saying is this. Whatever it is for you, be intentional about it. Be strategic about it. Don't, if they don't like your thing, don't force them. If you don't like their thing, don't force them, but find your thing. Find our thing. You need to find our thing and then become lifelong friends. It will serve you for the rest of your life well. Number four, I got to pick up the pace. Number four, so we talked about intimacy. We talked about unconditional love. We talked about deep friendship. Every man needs encouragement. Every man needs encouragement. Healthy men are driven by responsibility and duty. Now, I have to say healthy here because we live in a world, and you know this is true, that some men want no responsibility and nothing could be more unbiblical. <laughs> I, I, I want you to go back to Genesis, and I want you to remember this. God created the very first human, the very first Man, Bible says he built him out of the dust of the earth. He breathed the breath of life into his body. He became an animated soul. And when he comes to and looks at God, God said, go take care of that garden. It's the first thing he said to Adam. I want you to take care of something. I got you a job, boy. <laughs> I feel that's your application and everything. <laughs> I built that for you to tend to it, to care for it to oversee it, to look after it. I'm going to come back and check on you. First thing God ever gave man was a job. First. First thing he ever gave man was purpose. First thing he ever gave man was an assignment. But here's what I'm saying. Men who work hard and are driven to provide for their families need encouragement, and they feel empowered when they are appreciated. When a man is admired, respected, and appreciated for his efforts, for his sacrifice, for his hard work, it gives him fuel and motivation to keep going and to keep fighting. In fact, there isn't anything more motivational to a man than to know his wife is proud of who he is, and that she is honored to be called his wife. Ladies, I'm going to give you a secret today. I'm going to give you a secret. I'm telling you, you want to you wanna unleash the beast in a good way? Brag on your husband publicly. Brag on your husband to his face, behind his back, and in front of him in public. Affirm him and tell him that you believe in him. He will run through a brick wall to never let the dream die. Don't, don't, don't go, well, you should have done that. When you hand that boy a pickle jar, because you can't open it, and my man goes, you need to go, Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. You need to look at him and say, boy, you so bad. I tell you, right, there ain't nothing you can't do. And he'll kind of walk off like it didn't mean nothing, but when he walks off, he's going to go, good Lord, she's right. I mean, it's, I'm an animal. <laughs> boy, I am preaching fire, son. This is fire. It's the truth. It's the truth. I've told you this before, but I'm going to just, you, you know what I'm saying. Here's the, here's the nasty little secret. We are just little boys who shave now. That's what we are. We're just little boys. That shave now. We just drive bigger trucks. We wear bigger clothes. But deep down, we're just that little boy that works hard. But, but when we are appreciated and affirmed, I am telling you, I'm telling you, ladies, you brag on your man. And you will create... You will create a goal that he will strive to live up to. He will not want to let the dream die. He wants you to believe in who he is. And when you speak with words of encouragement, it changes everything. 
thing. And I'll tell you this. I'll take it a step further. A man can hear affirmation from everybody else around him, but, but, he, but if it is conspicuously absent from his wife, the rest of it means nothing. No matter who tells me how good a sermon was, if she tells me, boy, you preached the paint off the walls today. I'm like, son, you wait till next week. <laughs> I'm going to crush. Why is that? It's just the way God wired us. It, it just is. It's just the way God wired us to encourage one another. Let me give you some Bible right here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. The Bible says, don't use foul or harsh language with each other, but let everything you say be good. Let everything you say be good. Let everything you say be helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Build your husband's self-esteem, ladies. Tell him you believe in him. Let him know that you're in his corner, that you believe in him if nobody else does, and watch what happens. You will unlock a gear in your husband that will blow your mind. Number five and finally, every man really, really, really does long. We were built by God for spiritual connection, for deep spiritual connection. Let's go back to the text, okay? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. Listen to it. I put it on the screen for you. Wives, Understand and support your husbands in a way that show your support for Christ. For the husband provides leadership to his wife in the way Christ does to the church. Not by domineering. Listen, boys, not by domineering. Not by domineering, but by cherishing. By loving her more than we love ourselves. By considering her more than we consider ourselves. By putting her above ourselves. And when this happens, just as the church follows Christ in his leadership, wives should also respond to the leadership of their husbands. 14 years ago, God led me to initiate in our church, and many of you know this, the Men of Honor program. And one of the reasons why we did this mentoring program and still do, it was in response to the growing gap of spiritual leadership that is missing in our world. And as I counseled and talked with men, I noticed that spiritual leadership was one of the greatest challenges of their life. They had not been taught how to do it. They did not know how to lead. They did not know what spiritual leadership looked like. And many of them believed they were not even qualified to do it. So consequently, what happened is that men just began to opt out of spiritual leadership. And then what it left was this vacuum, and the woman had to step into a role that God never called nor equipped her to be in. And it's why fundamental Christianity is the only major religion in the world where women outnumber men seven to one. Because by and large, men begin to walk away from the church because of the feminization of the gospel and, and because they didn't understand spiritual leadership and they opted out. And by and large, women had to get up and take their kids. And women had to be the one that prayed. And women had to be the one that initiated. And it was not the way God created it or wired it to be. This isn't God's plan. And it goes against everything the scripture teaches about leadership. Spiritual leadership from a man in his home and with his family is not a biblical suggestion, gentlemen. It is a command. But what I want to say to every woman here, please hear, please hear, hear me here. What I want to say to every woman, every wife in this room is this, that it is one of the toughest jobs that your man will ever have in his entire life. It's deep, it's committed, it's sketchy, it's hard. We struggle with our own insufficiency. Because spiritual leadership is countercultural to all that he is taught from our fallen society, the gospel has, has initiated and engaged your man that is countercultural to what he has heard his entire life. And that's why it goes against the grain. And that's why we have to encourage him. See, the culture tells your man that in order to be a real man, he must conquer. But God says, no, if you want to be a real man, you must submit to King Jesus. The culture tells him that in order to be a real man, he must be successful. God says, no, to be a real man, you must surrender all of your life to a holy God. Culture says if you're going to be a real man, the ladies are going to love you. God says, no, if you're a real man, you will choose love and honor one woman for the rest of your life and discipline yourself to do it well. The culture says, if you're a real man, you'll be self-sufficient, not dependent on anyone. God says, no, if you're a real man, you will lean on me and trust in my strength and not your own. It's different and it's hard. 
And it's not what the world teaches us. And here's my point. If he is going to have the strength to be the man and the spiritual leader that God wants him to be, he needs his lady and his woman to encourage him in his walk with God daily. Pray for him. Affirm his leadership. Remind him how thankful you are for a man who loves God, loves God's house, and honors God in all of his ways. Tell him that. Help him grow in God's word and in the strength of God's Holy Spirit. Ladies, you play a vital role in helping create a man after God's own heart. Now, here's the last disclaimer. I've been saying it every week, and i got to say it again today. I'm going to say it again next week. Men, men, men. If you want to kill everything that God just did, go home, take this sermon, and use it as a badger or battery ram to your wife. Say, do you hear what pastor said? You you hear what you're supposed to be doing? You want to kill the work of God in your wife's life? Handle it foolishly that way. If you will, pray for her. Encourage her. Serve her first. And then today, maybe use this message to create meaningful, loving, humble conversation. I would encourage you to do that. But there's so many men and women, so many wives and husbands that'll hear a message like this and they'll just take it and and ruin everything that God did because of the tone and the tenor that we approach it. Listen, humility is the key. Be humble. And if I said something today that you've been trying to say to your wife for years and she's never gotten it, trust that God the Holy Spirit is going to do it today. And maybe as time goes on, open up meaningful conversation about it. Because let me just tell you, when we started this series, back at the beginning of June when Voices started, I began praying every day, every day, that God would give us a revival in our marriages in this church. The world treats marriage like it is nothing but lint in your pocket. A bottle cap, trash, means nothing. Your own personal happiness is everything. And nothing could be further from the scriptures. And my prayer is that God would create a revival of redemption in our marriages through this series. That we would, that men would love and honor their wives like they never have before. That women would honor and support the leadership of their husbands like never before. That our children would grow up and see in our marriage the picture of God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus working beautifully in our homes. 